Okay, strange enough for an Irish person, I think we'll start on time. So first of all, good Navin to everyone that's here this evening. Oh my God, I have a German speaker laughing at me. And to a lovely person I met, Mike, who's a New Zealander living in uh, Munich. He gave me a lovely phrase, which I butchered yesterday, and forgot to mention his name as well, is, uh, Welcoming ein mein Presentation. Which means, welcome to my presentation. Okay. So that's as good as I can do, but <laughs> not very often you get a round of applause before you even start, yeah. <laughs> anyway, hands up here who have been contributors to open source projects or maintainers, etc. Oh, I'm in trouble here, I won't be able to tell lies. Hands up here who have created those projects from the very, very start. Okay, a little less. So for a lot of us, maybe when we first started contributing, we come into a community that's there already. So the GitHub repos are there, there's a CICD in place, uh, there's a contribution ladder maybe, or maybe there's an in-between of how it is. But did you ever think if you haven't created a community, what goes into that? What needs to be set up? You know, where you don't, where you don't even have the code off the ground, where you don't even have a repo. Uh, like who's going to be the maintainers? Who's in charge of this? How, how does it work to get contributions in, etc.? So over the next 40 minutes, I'm going to walk through this of a community that started from scratch from a co collaboration between IBM and Red Hat. A little bit about myself. Um, so for the last 10 plus years, I've been working upstream in open source communities. I uh, started in OpenStack, then I was over in Kubernetes, and then lately I've come into AI. So it's very interesting for me to see the different technologies I've worked over time and now to look at AI and where we're trying to take AI and do it from an open source perspective because I'm very lucky in the company I work in We've done open source for a long time, and we have an open source force policy, and I get the support to go and do things right, the right way in open source communities. So I'm just going to give a little bit of context here, but I'm not going to go too deep into how this came about. And if you want to check out, I did a talk yesterday on, you know, the reason for this community and I suppose the problem we're trying to solve in the Unstruck Lab community, and you can check it out. Uh, it should be out in the next, then help me out here, a few weeks, the videos. No, all right, so in the next few weeks when they come out, okay, that I did yesterday. But the main problem we've looked at is, with large language models today, they're great, you can take them off the shelf, they have a lot of information, they're trained on a lot of information from the internet, etc. But there are moments where you want to put your own domain knowledge on it, in particular um, our clients. And the, the example I used earlier, or late, uh, yesterday was around, if you're a heat pump company, and you might have this basic knowledge around heat pumps and stuff, and that information doesn't change very often, then you might want to do some tuning on top of your model. So you're not training the whole model again, what you're doing is you're changing some of the layers and adding your context in there. And then other information that changes quite a lot, for example, when your employees go out into people's homes, they see problems, etc., that might go into a RAG. So it's not all or nothing RAG or, or, uh, or tune model, it can be both together. But what we found here is, because of the way models are out there, and we've the varying degree of models of openness, and what we're looking towards, and as we've seen uh, at the keynotes the first day, is around trying to define how open models are. Regardless, it's very hard to be able to tune models in an additive fashion without forking the models. Now, hands up here who thinks forking a repo is a good idea. Yes, there is a niche, there is a very small situation, but we'd say in a broad scale, anyone think it's a good idea? No, if we can avoid it, we try and avoid it. And it should be the same with models, but that's where we are today. And I use Llama here, not to pick on Llama, or the lovely little Llamas up in the top right hand corner. 
But, you know, there's a hell of a lot of llamas out there. And wouldn't it be nice if we didn't have to have so many different llamas? You know, it could be just built. It could be just uh, the knowledge built on top of it or trained. So my colleagues over in IBM Research uh, came up with a technique. And this is one solution for this problem we have with the forking of, of, um, of uh, large language models. And their technique is based around being, a, being able to add contributions or data on top of models. But the, the key of this technique is that you keep the base model as it is and that you have a taxonomy with all the different data inside it. And that data can be added as simple as PRs, pushing in the data. You don't need to have any uh, deep knowledge of AI for that, so there's no tensors in, tensors out. And each time then when you're running the full workflow, it's going to take that particular taxonomy of data, and you might have added your new piece of data on it, and it'll tune the base model each time. It'll do data generation because you'll need, you know, not tens of, of uh, examples, you need hundreds of thousands and then the tune in the models on top of that. And then a question that came up yesterday as well is, well, what happens if a new version of the base model comes out? Well, then the next time you use that new version when you do your full flow, and then you have a new version of the model. So that idea where you can add on those contributions. So I just want to give you that context because this is where the whole community uh, started off with. So I'm calling here crown zero or week zero. And you know, myself and a colleague, uh, Mark Struvenard, were asked by somebody to say, right, there's this new lab technique, uh, it's a way of tuning models. We want to see how easy it is to use one of these models on accessible hardware, off-the-shelf hardware. So, hands up here who, who knows that large language models are big beasts of things that needs a lot of hardware to run, sometimes run, but to tune or to, or to train. Do we all agree with that? Yeah. So it's it quite, and even like when you look at the full workflow, you know, you're doing end to end, it's a, it's, it takes a hell of a lot. And there's no way around that. And the industry is changing a little bit as well because the industry is pushing back and saying, right, we need it to be more cost effective. So small language models are coming in. So you're seven byte as opposed to your, two, your seven billion as opposed to your 200 billion models. But still, they take resources and time and, and, and money to be able to, to tune. But one of the things we wanted to do starting out with this, and I didn't know where this was going to go when we were asked to look at it and, and try and get the model running on, on, on a Mac, we said, right, can you take a model and can you run it on a Mac, a metal Mac? So we go with it because it's got a GPU and we turn 32 gigs of RAM. Now, you can get away with a 16 gig of RAM if you have 10 gigs of RAM free. So you'll need about 10 gigs of RAM if you're going to take one of these models. So myself and Mark didn't really, at the time, know what we were doing. We were given this tuned model and we said, get it running. Have a look at LAMA CPP. So we used the LAMA CPP framework. And then we realized we needed a quantized model. Now, we weren't the AI people. We didn't know what the hell a quantized model was, <laughs> let alone you know, how to make one. So then we figured, oh, all right, this is quantized. So, you know, in, in layperson's terms, it's, you know, you're 16 bytes for uh, an integer, suddenly it's four bytes for an integer. So you can see it's smaller. But with the quantized model, then it's not going to be as, you know, high fidelity or it's not going to give you, be as effective. But we wanted to be able to give people a chance to touch and feel models, to use models. Because when you're a developer, the last thing you want is something running away somewhere else and you can't, you know, play with it. You can't feel what it's like. You can't use it. Okay? And not everyone has the hardware to run it as well. So that was the first aspect of this. Could we do a POC and prove that, um, that a model could be run on a Mac? And we did. Now that was Friday or so. We got this request on a wednesday -ish. It was at the end of my day. My Mark was in America, so he was able to belt away. I went home and forgot about it until the next morning. But suddenly, on a Monday or Tuesday morning, Julia would probably know better. On a Tuesday morning, there was this big meeting set up between Red Hat and IBM. And it was announced that we were going to do a collaboration. Now, I do not know what happened from the moment we proved that you could run this model on a Mac 
and we wrote up a doc on it to suddenly we were doing a collaboration. So obviously a lot was going on behind the scenes. I think the technique and so forth was presented to the upper management, um, to Arvind and to um, Matt, Hicks. Matt, Matt Hicks, the CEO of Red Hat, and said, right, do you know what? We're going to take this and we're going to do it because we, both companies believe in open source. We believe in open source first and doing it the right. We said, right, we are going to create a community approach to be able to uh, tune models with contributions, okay? Because we knew always the most effective way to drive stuff is out in the open. So the collaboration kicked off. And what did that mean? So we had a meeting then on the Wednesday to define here what the key areas of work is. Now, first of all, we picked a group of experienced uh, AI engineers and a group of very experienced open source engineers from both IBM and from Red Hat. So we had a mix from both. Now, yes, Red Hat and IBM are under the one umbrella, but we both see each other as two separate companies. And for this to work, there's only, to get this off the ground is, the interface had to be the open source way. Because that's the only way it's going to work. We were, we're different companies, we were all in different localities, and it wasn't a case of saying, right, oh yeah, you all come in together, we're working. It wasn't the case. No, there was a lot of overlap where a lot, some of the, fo the folks that were in Cambridge, in IBM, we, uh, worked in the Red Hat offices in, in, um, in Boston, and so forth. So they seemed to be having a great old time over there, half the time. I said, you know, go for beers and having fun. But no, they were working very hard over there. And then the rest of us were spread around the world. We're having this ability to set things up and define. So we looked at it to start with, like this is how early it was. We were saying, right, we need a CLI because this is the touch and feel where somebody can use it, can play around, can try this ID to make a contribution. We need a back end because when these contributions come in and they're reviewed and so forth, we have to be able to do the full build. And when it started off, it was, we're talking 128 GPUs. I think there's about 60 gig of RAM per GPU and 25 plus hours to do the full workflow. Because it has, remember every time it's building from scratch, it's taking a base model, it's taking whatever contributions are there, it's doing data generation, then it's doing uh, tuning. So, and then it's publishing the model. So this, that takes time, it takes resources. So having to be able to use it is very important. And in between, wrapped around the thing, we need a community. So we needed an OSBO or whatever you want to call it. We needed a community structure around it. Now, this was the Wednesday. We had our first stand up on the Thursday. So there was no code at this stage. There was no GitHub org or whatever. And next thing go, right, on Friday, we want a running CLI. You know, all right, it's not going to be everything, but have something running to get the concept across. Now, the back end stuff was kind of, some of that was there a bit of it to start with. But the idea here was, right, let's pull it together. So at the time, there was four of us uh, writing that code. And Friday evening, we had something running. No, <laughs> you know what I mean? If you, if you look sideways, the thing fell over, but that didn't matter. We were able to get a basic running off the ground. Uh, we had a repo created with a GitHub board. Now at the time, we had to do this in, uh, and I'll talk about that in a minute, it would have been using um, private GitHub uh, repositories because we couldn't put it out there yet till we get some base off the ground. But our goal always was getting this out public as soon as possible. And that was the North Star that we were aiming towards. I think the title sums this up. You know, hustle was a word I, I never really had. We don't have it our side of the world. So it's my American friends over the years have taught me the word hustle. And it's a really good word, actually. Chaos, yeah, there was a lot of chaos involved. But as I said, we had nothing to start with. We had no code or anything. And we had to kick off the ground. We had a little bit of pop code that myself and Mark did that took Lama CPP to run it on, on a Mac to be able to run the model. And we started building from there. So as I said, we had all... We all these folks that we pulled together and right, you know, kind of volunteers and people who were asked to come on board, all trying to work together off the ground. So suddenly, GitHub repos started appearing up around the place, you know? 
uh, we had no CICD. You know, we had no, um, we had no, um, how would I put it? We had no format in or structure of how we wanted our, our, our code to be. So we had no um, code conventions, etc. So to start with, code was coming in left, right, and center. I know I, I'd finish for a day, maybe 12 at night, and I'd come in the next morning, and there could be 40 PRs pushed in from, from the States, you know? So that's the way it kind of worked. We, we just had to roll with it, and we created things as we went along. So I remember at one stage, someone says, right, we actually need to put in unit tests now, because stuff is going in and it's breaking stuff. So let's get that unit uh, test in, in, in place. So bringing structure around it and organization around it was really, really important. And you might say, oh, the right thing to use to start with is test-driven development. Oh, you need to put your documentations in, in place first. Oh, yeah, why didn't you have a CICD? We were doing, we were building the car while he was driving. You know, it was happening as we were going along. You know, I'll give kind of, I have a few stats here. Um, so as I say, f four contributors in that first, the end of that first week, week zero I call it. By week three, we had 12 new contributors. The following week there was 20, there was another 20. Uh, at this stage we're up to over 50. And after 100 days we had 105 contributors, 23 releases, 970 commits, 740 closed PRs, 37 open PRs, and 108 open issues after 100 days by the end of May. That was just the CLI. There was other repos involved. There was repos for the different parts of the back end, the data generation, etc., like that. But the key was from the start was make it so that people could get involved straight away. They could pull down a CLI, they could try it out, even if the CLI fell over. But the idea was that people could contribute. And I'll talk about it in a minute where we did crowdsourcing uh, and the amount of people that came on at the same time trying to contribute and help to drive it forward. Not to get lost in the CLI, the biggest part of this was around what we were trying to solve here was contributions. How could somebody push knowledge that could be taken and could tune the model so that the model you tried before it was tuned, they didn't have the knowledge, you would have it afterwards. And that's where the taxonomy came in. And that was the biggest part of the lab and what Instruct Lab is, is implementing. It's implementing that lab technique is around the taxonomy where the data is stored like a binary tree. If you think of a binary tree with leaves and nodes, just like down here, uh, but that isn't it exactly. But you know, it might be categories like history, art, sport, you name it. And then within that is the different types of of it might be Roman history, it might be, you know, wars, etc., and then broken down into that. And your knowledge is put in there then. And the idea here that people can add that knowledge without having any skills of, of, um, of AI, you know, where you just add the information. And it's in YAML files, and, and it can point then to different documents when you've done your knowledge. Uh, they're marked down at the moment, but I think we're going to move towards PDF and all that. But at the time, we were trying to get that off the ground. Then it was coordination between the CLI and the back end. Because the back end were making changes and then the CLI needed it. We hadn't everything broken out at the time. We had little separate entities and we were trying to do that as well. All the while why we were trying to run before we could even crawl or walk. And then, as I said, the amount of contributors that started coming on. The key to all this, oh sorry, the key to all this was people who came in and were able to self-organize themselves and were able to hustle to get things done. With so much happening and happening just in time, everyone had to, to just adapt and work with it. So having that experience, folks, that knew open source and were used to working in communities and realized that everything isn't perfect straight away, that helped move things along. So it was about making adjustments. It was about making changes. So like I talked earlier, it was about putting that structure in place where we had, you know, we had to get CICD getting off the ground. We had to start doing releases. How do we do that? Then we realized, okay, we better put a document in place to say what releases are. We then must look at what is our code and convention. 
So I remember at one stage holding up, I think it was for a day, was it when I was trying to put in LinkedIn and form it into it, because at this stage, you know, we were a couple of weeks in and everyone had a different style of writing code, because we all do. And I just had to lock everything down because I was changing files all over the place and say, right, and people, you know, I remember I was, I was trying to get it, make the changes and get it in, and eventually getting that in and saying, right, that's going to be the style going forward. You know, we put plint in, we put in different types of format and stuff like that, so that we could see a standardization across the code. But all these things, as I say, was you were putting the steering wheel in, you were putting the wheels on while you were trying to get the car f flowing. And the thing around the testing then as well was, I remember, I don't know, who, who, I think two people jumped on board and said, right, right I'm going to write unit tests here. But these unit tests were a little bit more complex because all of a sudden you had the idea of a model and trying to run a model somewhere. So how do we get that model off the ground? You know, so that started feeding into, well, we need some functional tests. You know, how will we do a basic functional test with, how will we get the model to call that? Will we get something back from the model? Because now you're looking at resources. Now you're looking at, well, can that model run there? How do we get a model running inside an, um, a GitHub Actions runner? Like, So these all, you know, it was, it was taking in the idea of, you know, AI, how to use large language models with the, the tools and processes we have with open source. How to get them to work together was the key. All the while, while new contributors are coming in, uh, add-in stuff. So while this was going on, getting the key code off the ground, uh, helping to set up the process for, for making contributions that were coming in, we, we needed a pro, uh, actually I'm going to jump down to it. We started crowdsourcing. So a suggestion came in and said that, okay, and at the time, I think the project was called Project Labrador, wasn't it? Yeah, because there was always this connotation to a dog, you know, a lab, a Labrador. So the idea was that age-old phrase, we need our own dog food, all right? That's the best joke I have on this, sorry. Uh, but what it meant was it said, right, you know what we're going to do? We're going to take 3,000 IBMers and Red Hatters, and they're going to jump into the, into the community, and they're going to start contributing. So they're going to start contributing data to the taxonomy, or they're going to start using the CLI, and they might make updates to the CLI or raise issues as they go along. Now, hands up here, who thinks, if you've ever been a maintainer in an open source project, and 3,000 people arrived one day at your open source uh, community or project, anyone think that's a good idea? All right. In case you can't see, there isn't a hand raised. There's a lot of giggling and laughing. It was insanity, uh, if I say it now. Um, yes, the goal and the, and the theory around it was really good because we really wanted to drive it. But the simulator that I used at the time was, it was like if you were building a house and you hadn't a foundation put down. And along came the roofers, the people for the windows, and the block layers all at the one time, and you were getting ready to pour the concrete. It was a little bit like that. So, you know, on top of what we were doing and people contributing, we had, you know, I think, was it about 50, 100 or 1,000 came first, and then there was another 1,000. Yeah, and everyone had, was well-meaning. They wanted to get in there. They wanted to make a contribution of some sort. But trying to balance that while you're you were having problems with your CICD, or you still hadn't got your, your conventions in place, or you were still trying to figure out who was maintainers and stuff like that. So we were doing it all at the same time, and it was a little bit mad. So on top of that as well is, we didn't really have any community structures around it. So a key part of this was, what was going to be the legal aspect around models? So first of all, can you use these models? Are these models open? Can they be used? What, uh, what the base models, what was the data set they were, they were trained with? Uh, is that data set open? Um, what about the contributions? Can these contributions be put into a GitHub repo? Because this, this hadn't been done before. Um, is that allowed? 
what happens about the data generation? Can that be made public? Can the published model be then put up on um, a public catalog like uh, Hugging Face or um, up in a llama or wherever you want to put it? All these things come into consideration. At the same time, you know, you were looking at, you know, well, we have it running on a Mac, that's great, but really we need this running on, on systems like Linux, Kubernetes, etc., OpenShift, whatever. So working at that, you know, what you know, what type of runtimes will we use on Linux? We went down the line of VLLM. Um, you know, looking how we are going to um, as I said earlier about the taxonomy process, how are we going to deal with contributions that come in? How are we going to review them? Does there need to be manual reviews as we go along? How does that tie in with the CLI? So this is where having the program office or open source community uh, team comes in, where they coordinate it across the different teams, where they look at the, le the legal aspects of this, where they look at how are we going to govern the community? Because you know, once we open this up, we need to have a ladder of you know, how people make contributions, if they want to move up to maintainer, etc. You know, um, you know, it was great to say that we all knew how to act in an open source way, but then you need to put those structures and governance in place for because people might come along and, and you know, you might have to say, well, sorry, that behavior isn't acceptable here. We needed landing pages. Like, you have to remember, we had no documentation, so where are people going to come? So we started with readmes, and then we go, well, really, we should have some set documentation where they can land in, or we need a landing page where they can come to. How are we going to point people to it? The other aspect we never look at is marketing. And I know, you know, unless you're a marketing person, you go, oh, marketing. But marketing really is, you know, you can't just say, I'll build something and they'll arrive. Because you could be sitting on your own there uh, waiting for people to arrive. So being able to put that out there, being able to promote that, being able to put a vehicle behind it, you know, so that, you know, suddenly you become cool and trendy or you have nice stickers. These are all parts of our nice sweaties uh, or t-shirts. It was putting all that in place while always our guidance star was, we want to get this opened as soon as possible. So when we did the soft launch, so we started with a soft launch because we said we'd open up the repos then. Now, leading into that was while we were doing a lot of this, we were doing it in private uh, GitHub repositories. Hands up anyone that has ever had to work with private GitHub repositories and then make those repositories public. How enjoyable is that? No. So while we had contributors coming in, and then we had these 3,000 people coming in, when you, use private, uh, when you use private repositories, you have to invite people to the repositories. And there's a cost associated to that. You can only invite so many people, and then you need to up your tiering. So there was one poor guy in the office in IBM in, in Cambridge that had to put his credit card on the, uh, on the, or, the org. And literally, he'd get a, every couple of days, he'd go, right, we've hit our limit, can you add it? The same happened with GitHub Actions that would run. We were hitting limits the whole time. Uh, you've hit your limit for the day. And we go, you know, uh, what, what's his name again? Luke, Luke sorry. We go, Luke, sorry, uh, you're going to have to bring up your limit there again. Now, he, he was in danger here that he thought, I think it was his personal credit card as well, he thought he was going to get maxed out. like. And then when you do transfer the repos over from private to public, it shuts all your PRs and your issues down. <laughs> so you have to open them again. So there was a lot of like, little challenges like that. So when we went to the soft launch, it wasn't that soft. It was a little bit bumpy. But we did it nice and silently. We got it out there. And I think that was a relief for everyone when we went that way. Because, you know, it's then all the things you expect. It's all your CICDs working, uh, your DCO works, all those key things you've in place. You no longer have to be, you know, restricted. We were then able to publish to PyPy and all like that because we didn't want to publish PyPy until we, you know, got the repos open. So we wanted the things in place so that when people came to community, they did. 
It was officially launched in at Red Hat Summit in Denver in May, and that was a brilliant launch. I have to say, Red Hat did a fantastic job of marketing it, putting it out there. You can see Moa's out there uh, from, from Red Hat. And it really was a great launch at, at the conference and it really showed what this community is about and get people there because you have to get it out there. And at the, at the summit as well, uh, a workshop was run where for about two and a half days, I think it was, I think about two and a half thousand people attended the workshop. It was an open shop workshop in an area uh, where uh, IBMers and Red Hatters uh, were instructors and walking people through the process. And I think one of the feedbacks came back from a lot of SMEs or domain experts was, we like this. So you're saying I can take a base model off the shelf, an open source uh, model, well, we call it open source model off the shelf, and I could use this workflow to train on top of the model. And we said, yes, oh, that's fantastic. Because they looked at the aspect of, right, you have to remember, we're doing this in an open way and a contribution be an open way, but not everybody will want their data out there. So that they have a workflow then that they can train a particular model where they keep their data private is very important to them because that's their value. And doing it the open source way and having it out there is always a way to drive that innovation forward. And we always believe in that, as does um, Red Hat. There was announcements as well at AI Dev and, um, and IBM Think. So where would you be without challenges? Um, when, I, when I saw that picture, I said I'm going to have to get it because I remember doing a hike somewhere near the end of the day and trying to go up a steep set of steps like that and the pain in the backs of my legs. So, there's always going to be challenges with this. But I think one of, the, and one of the things involved was, as I said, there was, we had two groups of people. We had people who were AI engineers and experienced uh, with AI, but maybe not as much experience with open source. And then we had open source folks. So that ability to bring everyone along at the same time, you know, AI people teaching AI to open source people, and open source people teaching open source to AI people. You know, it can happen. All dogs can be taught AI eventually. Uh, the AI people are much faster picking up the open source, I have to say. But that way of being able to bring both in at the same time. As I say, we were trying to build a car. We were driving the car and trying to build it at the same time. So we were running while, you know, before we could even crawl. So, Having to deal with all that and try and balance it and put the structures in place that are so important and we take for granted in open source communities uh, w was the key. And we, we did it as we went along. And I don't know if you've ever had to deal in stuff in life where nothing is perfect and you have to, you know, I remember one time I had to, my son was, was a trainer and I had to pick him up and my daughter was very small and, and I was we were running out the door and she got sick. And <laughs> I didn't know what the hell am I going to do. And I was a case of like, get the clothes off her, you know, get her changed, go pick my son, come back, read their stories, give him food, and then clean up afterwards. And I just had to do that in the order. And I remember my wife came home and they said, oh, you had a great evening sitting around at home. And I was, I was fit to kill her actually, because I'd been, I'd been running around so much. But that idea where you do the things you need to do as you go along, it's not perfect, but you put them in place. But then have, you have those structures in place afterwards then when you open it up fully into the communities. I talked about the GitHub repositories and private repositories and the pain involved with that. And if you've done that before, you know the pain that's involved with it. Um, yeah, that's a bit challenging, but you know, that's just a part of life trying to do that. And I've also talked about the amount of change that was coming in, the amount of contributors coming in. And you know what, it's, it was fabulous because People came in and did things when they needed to be done. Like I said about the testing, someone did the unit testing. Next thing, a functional test script arrived one day, and that is built and built. And then the integration happened. So there's a full integration across that works as well. So they got put in place. Someone else put in um, the tool Mergeify to, to help merge in, um, to help merge in commits and stuff when you know it's configured when two people have uh, okayed it and everything's in place with the CI/CD. It automatically merges. All those little things help going along. The last one, managing contributor expectations. So, you know, hands up 
if you've, you know, you've been a maintainer in a, in a project and someone comes and they're really, really interested in something and really want to get something in, but it's not what you want in the project. Hands up if that has ever happened. Hands up if that's turned into a bit of a bun fight out in GitHub with comments over and back and you're trying to steer the person and say, you know, in a nice way, say, oh, that's great, but you know, we, you know, it's not suitable for this, but the person is like a dog with a stick, they just won't let it go. Yeah, that is, I think, um, a lot of people, you know, people who, who've experienced the open source community, they've mentioned it once, I think Dims a few times, if people know Dims, he's had talked about it a few times about somebody, look at this. Like, yeah. So, yes, yeah, sometimes people come in wanting stuff that we didn't want. One example I remember, it was after a few weeks was, a person came in and they wanted, they had a very niche flavor of Linux. And they had an IDE they used, and they wanted these configuration files that it would, their IDE would work out of the box with the CLI in their set way. And they said, okay, put that in there. And I went, you know, sorry, we're not supporting that version or whatever. Okay, that's grand, that's grand, I don't mind. But just put these, these, these files into your repo. And I was, this person is serious. And I went, oh, well, we can't put them in because we're not supporting them. No, no, you don't understand, you know? Don't be so, don't be so pig-headed. Put the files in, it's not gonna harm it. And I just had to say, like, who here thinks putting random files into your repo is a good idea? So I kind of had to kind of just work with the person and uh, I could feel they were a bit agitated uh, about it, but there's nothing you could do. So sometimes this balance and that expectation is, you know, uh, is, you know, and people, you know, as a maintainer, they think you're being stubborn, but, you know, sometimes you have a bigger understanding of the overall picture than, you know, the specific picture that the person is looking at. Have I jumped? No. Good God. Something's after happening. All right. Sorry about this, but I think after freezing. Okay, one second. Magic. Uh, okay, I'm gonna have to go this way. All right. So the takeaways from this Hands up here who thinks technology is more important than people. God. You come to a normal conference and nobody thinks technology is better than people. One thing I've learned over a period of time working in the industry in the early last 30 years is technologies come and go. But it's the people that's the key. And one thing we saw on this is Yes, there was moments where there was a bit of tension and a bit of heat and a bit of so forth, but overall, everybody put getting the stuff done over their own a personal gains. People had to deal with situations, as I said, driving the car, you know, while we we're still building it. Like, in an ideal world, you don't want to do that, but no world's ideal, you know? And the way people were able to work together and get things done. And what open source brings to do that, the processes and the tools that we have from open source. That's why a lot of us have brought open source into our companies with inner source today for some of our projects and how it's driven things on. Because I remember a time that someone went, Git, why would we use Git? You know, GitHub, why would we use GitHub as well? Why would we use this? You know? Those things that we take for granted out in open source is the reason why we can collaborate together. Yes, compromise is the big thing too. And we all have to compromise. Yes, there are certain tools I don't like, but I'm not going to put a flag in a hill and lose my life over it, you know? Yeah, if you want to go with that, yeah, let's go with that tool. Yeah, I don't particularly like it, let's go with it. And that's what it comes down to. But it's people working together and people's ability to adapt was the most amazing thing. And I suppose I better finish off with this. Um, 
Here's a community. If you want to get involved, please come. Uh, Julia's here and she'd love to people around the contribution because at the end of the day, we have the tools and structures in place. And you know, it's great if you want to come in and help with the CLI or if you want to help with the data generation uh, project and stuff like that. Because what we've done now is we're moving along once we became open is we're, we're making them more configurable. So with the CLI down the line, you could potentially be pointing to a model that's doing the generation. So the um, teacher model that's doing the generation could be running on big hardware. It could be big, huge LLM, it's 200, uh, uh, 200 billion parameters. Uh, your um, tuning could be somewhere else pointing it, or you can put it and configure it in your own thing. So we're looking at profiles and stuff because hardware is going to be important going forward. But the overall building of the project for the community, it, it will always use the back end. So when the contributions come in, Julia and other folks will come in and review those contributions and say, right, are they good? Do we think that's good as an initial review? And then it'll go through the process then of trying it out, uh, automating and see if it's okay to go. And then after that, if it gets through that process and improves the model, then that's merged. And then eventually then, uh, during a periodic cycle, we're still working on what the cycle is. Um, after a period of time, then there'll be new published versions of the model put out, built with that contributions in place. So if you want to get involved, please come. We're still still at an early stage. You can see here there, if you want to go out to Slack, or if you want to come in um, out into the community pages, just do, or scan a QR. I don't scan QRs, but yeah, away you go with it. Okay. All right. Thanks very much, folks. <laughs> Any questions quickly? Or you can just grab me out in the hallway. Okay. Thanks to Mike down there for giving me a bit of German. And uh, thank you, Veld, everyone, and uh, enjoy the end. Okay. Thank you.